great day to be alive. Go ahead and grab your seat. We're going to get right into our teaching today. We love the Word, and we love worship at Church Alive. Amen? Amen. Hey, real quick, I want to give you an all-in update. Thank you. Uh, so far, we're, we're on a track for $2 million in two years. Everybody say $2 million. In two years, and we're on track for that. Let me, uh, if you'll put that other slide up. Uh, I want to show you where we are. Go ahead and put the next one up. Uh, for me. So far, we've received $412,032.97. Can we give the Lord praise for that? Come on, church. Hallelujah. want to encourage you, if you have made a commitment to All In, be faithful to that commitment. If you have not yet made a commitment to All In, or you even know what All In is, we're moving from this campus to another campus in a very short few uh, months from now. Oh, hallelujah. Uh, everybody sit tight. We're not burning down, I promise. Is anybody else hot in here? And I'm not even preaching on hell today. So, I mean, this is pretty, pretty intense heat right now. So, uh, we'll try to get the air on or at least open, a, open up a, a door. We have several doors on the wall, but they won't lead to anywhere. <laughs> They're just there. Can't get anywhere with them. So uh, if you made a commitment, please continue to be faithful with that. It's not too late to join us uh, in our commitment uh, all in. Everybody say all in. All in. I also want to say this. Thank you to everybody that came out and helped with our share of blessing. Uh, yesterday, I think uh, we ended up with about 120 boxes of food for the community. Can we give the Lord praise for that? Amen. I think uh, very soon we'll be doing five and 600 boxes of food. Amen? It's called multiplication. We want to make it difficult for anybody in this region to not know that God exists and that God loves them. Amen? Uh, and that's done usually outside the walls of a building. It's done with actual uh, acts of kindness and goodness and, and graciousness uh, from our hearts. Today I want to get right into our teaching. Uh, some things to share at the end about where we're going uh, in looking at some uh, opportunities. Town hall meetings Tuesday at 7, Wednesday at 7. You don't have to come to both. I encourage you to come to one of these. You'll understand why in just a moment. Uh, we have child care provided for you, so come and be a part of that. I think that some in the house struggle with God uh, especially from the angle that we can't figure God out. See, we often want a God that we can figure out, put inside of our little box, our preference box. I call it my, my preference box, and I need God to be what my preference is or, or who I say he is. But i got to tell you, God is not into being uh, figured out. He's actually sometimes very hard to figure out. How many of you have ever found God to be hard to figure out? Let me see your hand. We struggle with his plans because we can't figure him out. I rather say, I think God's wisdom, everybody say wisdom, wisdom. is often foolishness to us. Right. Listen, I think the wisdom of God, God's plan, his path, uh, his ingenuity, uh, he's, a, he's an innovator, he's a creator. Everybody say creator. How do I know? Because he created you all across this room uh, are masterpieces uh, at the hand of God. And, and, uh, but I think sometimes his wisdom is foolishness uh, to us. I wrote this down. I think when God does some things that are illogical, watch out for the extraordinary. Everybody say extraordinary. No, I'm going to tell you, I think most Christians um, uh, should jump up, jump up and down for extraordinary. But a lot of people get nervous with extraordinary. Uh, we just want ordinary, just give me enough of God, just enough of those or enough of this, uh, enough, uh, enough to do me. I want to check on some people in Scripture here in just a moment who had some say what moments. I wonder if you've ever had a moment where you thought one thing was going to happen and then God showed up with revelation and wisdom and it made you go, say what? Everybody say, say what? Anybody ever had a say what moment with God? I mean, wait a minute, I thought, that's it? How many of y'all are living? I mean, I, I, I don't, I've not figured him out yet, and I'm, I'm, pretty, I mean, I'm pretty close with God, and I'm as close as I want to be, but, but I've not figured him out yet. I've had lots of say what uh, moments with God. Isaiah uh, 55 verse 8, the prophet Isaiah is a fiery, prophetic man uh, who really doesn't have much of a filter when it comes to thus saith the Lord. Here's what he says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So this is God saying, you're thinking one way. I'm thinking another way, right? He says, neither are your ways my ways, 
declares the Lord. Now, if you dig through this a little bit, by whose authority does God say that, by the way? By what authority does God say his thoughts are not your thoughts and his ways are not your ways? Well, he did create everything. Come on now. Uh, He is the author and therefore he has the authority, but he comes from the premise of righteousness. Everybody say righteousness. I don't always have righteousness. I know you might find this hard to believe as much as I want to. Uh, my, my thoughts and plans may not always be from a righteous perspective. Uh, there might be some selfish gain or some selfish interest or some selfish ideas attached with it. And so for God to say that, he's really saying, look, you're trying to determine, if you read the context of this, who I can love and who I cannot love, who I can save and who I cannot save. And you need to understand that I don't think the way that you do and I don't do things the way that you do. And you would do good to understand that and kind of track with me and track with how I'm thinking and track with what I'm doing. Can somebody say amen? Now I gotta tell you, I'd rather be in an extraordinary place with God where I don't understand and be tracking with him at his higher plane of thinking and his higher way or better way of doing things than to be over here on my own, making my own path, even being successful uh, in doing it from time to time. I'd rather be on the plane with God, thinking and doing things the way he would do them. Amen? But I got to tell you, that's risky. Everybody say risky. Because there's some say what moments in scripture. There's a ton of them. I'm only going to hit a couple of them here in just a second. But before I do, the foolishness of God is pure genius. I'll say it again. The foolishness of God is pure genius. Look at what 1 Corinthians 1, Paul writes to the Corinthians. For the message of the cross is foolishness. Now, if you're born again in this room, you would never say that the message of the cross is foolish because you have taken in the truth into your life and it has transformed you from the inside out. So therefore, you're living that from the angle of power and not foolishness. But for those who are perishing, the Bible says the message of the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Let's look at a couple people in Scripture here, and they had some say what moments. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, Abraham, who's not yet called Abraham, he's called Abram, has an encounter with God. And it goes like this, the Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. Now here's what the Lord's saying, watch this, you will know as you go. Watch this. Everybody say that with me. You will know as you go. In in other words, the Lord said, I'm not going to tell you where to go. I'm just seeing if you will go. And then as you go, you will know. Now, the Bible says that it's credited to Abraham as righteousness that he obeyed the Lord, even though he didn't have all the details. Now, some of you in the house score an eight on the Enneagram, and that means you are detail-oriented. You need all of them. You need uh, up one side, down the other. You need to study them and to make sure that you have all the details. How many of you need the details? Let me see your hand. Uh-huh. I knew, I knew we had a house full of you. Mm-hmm. My hand's not raised. I don't have to have all the details. Uh-huh. Well, what is it? What is eight? What's the detail? Oh, one. Excuse me. If you're a one, are you a one? My, 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 my. You see who I'm married to? Mm -hmm. God put the exact opposites together. Because I I just need to know God's there. I'm like, okay, let's go. And and my wife is like, I need A, B, C, D, E, F, G. H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. I'm like, no, I did all that mess. We just got to go. If the Lord says go, let's go. Well, how are we going to get there? I don't know. I don't care. I really could care less about that. I just want to know where God is. That's where I want to be. Now, the world can't be full of people just like me. There's got, we got to have ones. We need a few of them. Uh, just kidding. We need some of them. The Lord said, Abram, leave your mama, your daddy, your cousins, your uncles, your aunts, everything, and go. Where am I going? Not telling you. I just want you to see if you'll go. See, I think the Lord wants to see if we will go And then he will give us the no. Come on now. He'll give us 
the no. Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. So Abram left. I love this. As the Lord had told him. God gave him enough details for him to walk in blessing. Are y'all with me? God will give us just enough details sometimes to walk in blessing. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Watch this. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. Boom. Abram left. He went And then God gave him the detail. He said, this is what I'm going to do. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now watch this. We we will often answer God's go with a fearful no. No, I won't go. Now I'm going to tell you, God will probably bless you in your no. But I got to tell you, he's really going to bless you in your go. Did you hear what I said? I don't think God's going to withhold blessing from you if you say, no, I'm going to stay out right here. I'm going to stay here. I'm not going to do anything. Uh, I, I, but I believe that God will amply bless us if we're willing to go. We need every detail because we're afraid to fail. Do you hear what I said? We need every detail because we're afraid to fail. But I'm telling you, if you knew every detail with God, you would run. Did you hear what I just said? You would run so far away from God because it doesn't make sense. How many of you know that sometimes God doesn't make sense? I mean, he just does not make sense. So God often makes himself known through the unknown. Now let's pick it up with another guy who had a say what moment. Everybody say say what? Moses. Moses is a murderer. He's also a nomadic man who's running Uh, from the authorities, and he's found himself in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of sheep, and there's nobody around. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Oreb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, everybody say thought, my ways are higher than your ways, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. The Lord has declared that through the prophet Isaiah, because there's a struggle with what God can and what God cannot do. I want you to know as a pastor of this church, I believe all things are possible. I said I believe all things are possible. No, I don't always direct my life that way. But when the rubber meets the road, I'm going to believe that all things are possible. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Everybody say strange. Why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him, God's ways are higher than our ways. What God does in our midst will not always look the way we think it should look. Did you hear what I said? It might be strange sometimes. Everybody say strange. Strange. Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Now watch this. It wasn't until Moses took the first step to go check out what was happening that God spoke to him. He didn't speak to him while he was hanging out over here looking at it. It's when he made a move, the Lord said, Moses. And watch what Moses says. Here I am. So I think that God will often accomplish the extraordinary from an ordinary moment. We just need to be aware of God's in it. So when God says, here I am, or when we say, here I am, God says, I am here. Here I am, God. I'm over here. God says, I'm here. Where are you? I don't see you. I don't know you. I I can't discern. I'm here. Here I am, God. And God says, I am here. God orders our steps. It will take faith to get us there. Did you hear what I said? God orders our steps. That'll shout. But the faith part, mm, I don't know about that. I, I I need all the details. I need all the logic. Say what? There's a bush burning, and I want you to go lead my people out of Egypt. Say what? Look, I'm not your man. You got the wrong man because I'm a murderer and I can't speak correctly. No, you're going to go, 
I'm going to give you this staff in your hand, and you're going to tell them that I am has sent you. Everybody say, I am. Here I am. I am here. Be careful. Here I am. Well, where is God? He's everywhere. Everybody say everywhere. He's in your future. He's in your present. He's already there. And so he orders our steps. We just have to have the faith to take the step. Listen, did you hear what I said? He's not going to make you take the step. We got to have the faith to take the step. Laura, I want you to join me uh, up on the stage. Let's give Laura a hand today. My better half. Lord knows it's true. So we have been on a journey here at Church a lot, and we're at another one of those say what moments. Everybody say say what. what? I'm, I'm going to break it down for you. When we first moved here, that was a say what moment because I did not want to move back to North Carolina. When I left, I left for good. I left everything behind me, and I did not want to have to come back here and deal with all the mess and, and anything that I had already overcome to be back here and deal with it again. So I was done with North Carolina, but the Lord said, no, I want you to go back, uh, and I want you to plant a church there. And I'm like, no, I want to go to Colorado, or I want to go out west, or I want to go somewhere else. I want to go to North Carolina. I love North Carolina, but I don't want to live here anymore. I did 18 years of my life there, and they were hell. And so I'm done. I don't want to do it anymore. The Lord said, nope, go. I said, say what? Please say something different. I am Here I am, God. I am here. Here I am, God. I am here. I don't want to go there. Then you stay there, but I'm going to find somebody that will go with me over here. Well, wait a minute, God, I'll go with you. All right? So that's how the journey started. It started crazy. Uh, and every step of the Church of Life journey has not been predictable. Amen. It has been unpredictable. So I need to warn you, if you are new to our church and you think you have found the most predictable uh, uh, place on the planet, you are in the wrong place. This place is unpredictable. Okay, because I find God to be unpredictable. And so I get my plans and then I say, here I am. And the Lord says, no, I am here. Are you going to go here or are you going to stay here? Or it's safer to stay here, but only in the natural is it safe. So we came here uh, and I, I even told Laura, uh, you know, we're going to move to North Carolina Planet Church. So, yep, let's go do this. So then we got here and we started meeting in a preschool. Nobody has church in a preschool. You're not going to grow a church in a preschool. It's not going to grow. Da -da. It grew, outgrew it. And uh, the Lord said, uh, I, I prayed. I said, Lord, here I am. Sometimes we say, here I am because we think God has forgotten us. Listen, here I am. Am I going to be in a baby booty house forever? Can we move out of the, the preschool somewhere else? And so all the parents in the house know what I'm talking about. And so Westlake Middle School opened up, and we went to Westlake say, what? I mean, I thought we were going to have a building right away. Most churches build buildings right away. Church Alive did not build a building right. In fact, we've never built a building right away. We've never built a building. <laughs> and so we moved to Westlake, say what moment there it grew, and then we moved here. This was, to date, the greatest say what moment of all. Because this building was a wreck, it was a mess, um, and we, we came and viewed it. The elders and I looked at it and said, oh my goodness, God's not in this. Here I am, God. I am here. This is what the Lord said, I am here. Please don't be there, God. <laughs> Can you be somewhere else, please? I am here. Okay, God, we'll take this journey. It's not always been popular. It's not always been the, the, the logical thing to do. Everybody say logical. We took this journey. We've been on this journey here for 11 plus years, 12 years uh, on this site right here. God has blessed this church. Uh, this church has grown five times the size it was when we moved in here. Can we give the Lord praise? Yes. Hallelujah. Now you say, what's the big deal about that? Because there are people in this region that need Jesus. And we need to be doing something and be a part of something that creates curiosity for people to come to know Jesus. So now we're in this journey now, and uh, we, for the last year to a little over a year, we've been designing a building. Everybody say designing. The first building that I designed, uh, the builder came back with a price, and we quickly threw it away and put it in the trash can. <laughs> it was insanely expensive. I was like, say what? It can't be that expensive. It is. It's crazy. 
And so we began to chisel away. At the, it, was a conven, it is a conventional building. We began to chisel it down and chisel it down and chisel it down because the bank has come back and said, Pastor Glenn, we will loan Church Alive five and a half million dollars to build your building. Can we give the Lord praise for that? Yep. But I got to tell you, you can burn through five and a half million dollars just like that. Like the site work alone is insanely expensive. And so I began to get discouraged and, and uh, I would come home and go, I don't know what we're going to do. I mean, uh, if we keep whittling this building down, it's not even going to be the size of the building that we have. And I'm like, that makes no sense. Here I am, God! I am here. Ooh. Wait a minute. Now, it's easier to take risks with God when you're smaller. It's more difficult to take risks with God when you're larger as a church. Listen to me. It's easier to be risky when you're smaller. It's not as easy to be risky when you're larger. Right? In the logical mind. Everybody say logical mind. I'm like, what are you talking about, God? And so we continue to will it down. I went away in October and I, for, for, to set purpose to fast and pray because the bank had told me what they were going to loan. And the builder came back and said the building that we currently have, when it's all said and done, is going to be about $9 million. How many of you know there's not a lot of reconciliation between five and a half and $9 million? I mean, I can't even figure out how we're going to reconcile that. And so I was, okay, well, Lord. And so I laid, I, I went away, checked into the hotel that night. And I was going to pray and, and, and do some writing and fasting for a couple of days. And right before I lay down, I checked my email. And I got an email <coughs> from a builder or a product. Listen to me, church. And uh, it's something that we had looked at as a church about 13, 14 years ago, and I had completely forgotten about it. And uh, I thought, oh, my goodness. And so I, I began to research this building. And so we're down to options now. Everybody say options. We have three options in this church. And one of them is not staying here because we don't own this building. Are y'all with me, church? We can't stay here. We're not buying it back. We out of here. All right. Yep. And so we're down to three options that I see. Now, God always has more options than what we see, by the way. I was down to one option, and now I'm, I'm at three. So he's already... Uh, multiplied it uh, three times from the one that, that, I, that I saw. And so, uh, so I got this, and I sent it to Laura right away. And so, Laura, I want you to take that microphone. and Because and, uh, I always run everything by Laura. She's a one. I'm a high seven. Uh, I think way outside the box. And, uh, and I can think something's a great idea. And uh, she'll bring the pay. I mean, she'll bring the reality to it. <laughs> Everybody say reality. And so my first thought was, hmm. I need to measure this by Laura. And so I sent it to Laura, and I said, look at this. And what did you say? I said, instead of say what, why not? That's what she said. When she said, why not, I thought, oh, my, my, my. <laughs> okay, if I can win her over to it. And what I'm about to show you, I'm not going to show it to you right this second. It is a little odd. Everybody say odd. odd. I need you to know that Church Alive is a little odd. Okay, so none of that bothers me. We are very, uh, we're just a little odd bunch of people, broken people that God has put back together, right? Uh, and so I know that, and I'm like, okay, well, this would be kind of humorous if God actually led us to do this because this is really outside even my box of thinking. I can't even take the credit for thinking this up because it came to me in an email, and I began to research it again. I called the pastor. Uh, the product that I'm going to show you, and we're looking at, we're, we have three options, and I'm breaking this down for you right now. We have a conventional building and two pre-engineered buildings that we're looking at. One of them is safe. Uh, it kind of looks like the gym, but we'd make it look a lot better. But the other one is a little odd. Everybody say odd. odd. And it made me go say what? But I got on the phone, and I called I call a pastor who, the building I'm going to show you is used by... NASA, it's used by Amazon, it's used by churches, it's used by the NFL, it's used by community centers, it's, it's used a lot, but it's just not something that you would see a, a lot, and then when you see it, you go, say what? Everybody say, say what? So I called the pastor out in California, uh, it's about 3,000 people in the church, so about, uh, we're about 11, 1,200 here, so about three times the size of our church, and I said, why did you, why did you build that building? 
And uh, he said, well, we needed space and we needed it quickly. And we needed it to be affordable. Everybody say affordable. And he said, so we took the plunge. We did the research with the conventional. We did the, the pre-engineered steel. And we looked at this building. And this building by far got us in it qu more quickly and was the most economical uh, of it. And I said, well, how do you heat and air this building? He said, just like you would any other building. And then he said this. He said, but you need to know this, but our savings in the heating and air in this building is two-thirds of what it costs us. We're saving two-thirds from what it costs us to heat and air our traditional building on the campus. So now my ears are perked up, and I'm thinking, okay, here I am, God! I am here. I'm like, no! Huh? Yeah, and, oh, and the other part of it is he said, and it costs us 45% less than the conventional building was going to cost us. Now, when you're talking about millions of dollars, that's a lot of money. Everybody say a lot of money. Now, you know as well as I do, if you've been here long enough, we're about people in this church, and we're not always about the building. Look at where we meet now. Nobody's writing books or stories about how state-of-the-art this building is. Right? Are y'all with me? You are not in this building because it's state-of-the-art. You're in this building because there's a God that is state-of-the-art and beyond. Come on, somebody. All right, so, so I, I, Laura said, why not? So I said, okay, I'll start researching. So I called. I called another, there was another pastor in California uh, at Saddleback Church. It's one of the largest churches in America. Rick Warren is the pastor uh, who has done several of these buildings on his campus. And um, it's a very large church, 10,000 plus people. And uh, so I'm going, okay. Uh, so I started, uh, brought it to our elder team. I believe in unity. Everybody say unity. I can have all the ideas I want, but I submit those and we pray for them. Our elder team, each one uh, prayed about it. And we came back and we said, we'd be crazy not to look at this. Everybody say, look at it. We'd be crazy not to explore this from the sheer numbers of, of what it costs to do the other versus what this cost in that way. And so one of the elders, Scott Prowl, who was in our last gathering, piped up and he said, we could be called church, church in the yurt. <laughs> do y'all know what a yurt is? You do. I know you do. Anybody know what a yurt is? Oh, bless your hearts. Okay, good. And you're not smiling about it, so... So I want you to see this picture, but before you put it up there, I need you to know that on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week, I've asked the representative for this building to come here and to explain this building the way that he explained it to the elders and I and the staff. Because I had them come here because I don't understand the fullness of this building, and I had lots of questions, and they answered every single question that I had. All right, so you're going to have lots of questions, and I want you to go to their website. I'm going to give it to you in just a second. It's called sprung.com. Everybody say sprung.com. I want you to go to their website, go through the whole website, look at, has anybody ever heard of a sprung building? Let me see your hand. In the back, yes, that's it. Okay, I want you to see the church in California uh, here that, that uh, now you look at it and you go, oh my gosh, what is that, right? Let me tell you this. It is not a tent. Everybody say tent. It is not a tent. And when I first saw it, I went, say what? Uh, are you sure that you want me to look at this building, God? All right? And so go to the next picture. The only thing different about this building is the outside. What you can do on the inside of this building is no different than what you can do on the inside of any other building. Let's go to the next one. This, go back to that one. That building seats uh, 1,100 people. So they're, they're doing three services in this building, 1,100 people. Go to the next one. All right, that's their lobby. You can go to the next one. That's their outside. And you're thinking yurt, 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 church in the yurt. Some of y'all are going, come on now. This, yes, this is the lobby. There's no difference to uh, the inside of the building. Is there another one? Or is that the last one? That might be the last one. Sprung.com. I want you to go and say, Pastor, why are you spending time on Sunday on this? Because it's important. Because if we put this building up, there's going to be a whole lot of Wake County that's going to want to know what is in that building. But I actually think that's good. Because curiosity will cause people to come check it out. 
And then when they come check it out and they see what's going on inside of the building, they actually might stay. Come on now. Do you know that this building is used for gymnasiums, uh, for community centers? It's used for in, in any way that you can think uh, possible, but it, it takes an out-of-the-box thinker to get there. And they say, get there. So I asked the pastor, I called him back in California. I said, what was the greatest hurdle and do you have any regrets doing this building? He said, we have zero regrets doing the building. So praise the Lord for that. I said, what was your greatest hurdle? And here's what he told me. In all honesty, he said, the greatest hurdle with this building was convincing my seasoned people that this was not a tent. This was a building. And he said, it literally took me a little while to do that because they already have a couple of traditional brick and mortar buildings. But he said, now that we're in the building, we would never go back because it makes fiduciary sense that you don't burden the church with so much debt that you can't do the ministry that needs to be done. Amen? Yes, amen. So, listen. Now, here's the deal. I've already decided this. Somebody's going to say, why can't we do a conventional building? We can. And if somebody walks in this building and writes a $5 million check to Church Alive, we are on like Donkey Kong. I'm being honest with you. That's my thing. I got to tell you, we will do it. We will do. But there's a reason Liberty just put up one of these buildings on their campus. There's a reason universities and, and, uh, and other organizations are using this building because it, you can't get anything built this way for the dollars that you save in putting the building and the time frame. Let me give you the time frame. The building itself would go up in 55 days. Everybody say 55. No, I didn't say. I I mean, you still got to get through the town and you got to get through the permitting. All that's the same. It's the exact same uh, as you would do any other building, but that takes time. Everybody say time. But when it comes time with all the site work is done and that building goes up in 55 days, that building's up. And you talk about people wanting to know what in the world is that? But don't they say that about God? I'm just being honest with you. Don't they say, what in the world has God done? Or what what is that? It doesn't make any sense. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go visit this website. You'll see all kinds of sprung structures on there. In fact, Amazon now uses these almost exclusively. Uh, And Amazon has more money than anybody can even spend in a lifetime probably. Uh, but they have found that it's much cheaper for them to do this for some of their projects than it is building brick and mortar uh, in relationship to, to what they do. Their headquarters is out west. It's phenomenal. They used these mostly in the north originally. This company's been around since 1870-something. But it was used initially in the north because snow does not stick to this building. Well, we don't have that problem here in North Carolina. It doesn't snow, Right. Our issue is wind. Everybody say wind. I need to tell you this neat story. There is a church in Wilmington that has this building as their church. They also have a traditional building right beside it. When the last hurricane that came through Florence was very, very difficult for Wilmington, they had no damage to this structure, but their brick and mortar had damage in several places. So these buildings are actually designed... Uh, to, to hold uh, or to ha- hold steady for winds up to 180 miles an hour. Well, if you're in a wind of 180 miles an hour, nothing's going to be standing anyway. Come on now. And so, but there's a lot of questions attached with it. I want you to write them down. I want you to be here. Um, I want you to be here Tuesday or Wednesday, but you do the math. 45% of 9 million, you can do the math for yourself. All right. How many of you know that's a lot of money? It's a lot of money, and it's a lot of savings <coughs> that we aren't building poor, but we are building adequate so that we can be the church outside of the building. Are y'all with me, church? Yeah. Amen? Laura, do you want to say something? Amen. I thought for her, will the women like it? She said, yeah. I mean, right? Didn't you say that? No, you didn't say that. She yeah. said, why not? She said, why not? <laughs> I don't know if that's a matter of living with me for so long that she just simply says, why not now? I want you to pray with us. I'm very serious about this. We're also looking at pre-engineered 
uh, steel as an option, but the span of that building, would you put that building back up? The peak of that building is 52 feet. It is not some unobscure building down on the ground. It is high. Everybody say high. We had to reduce the height of the conventional building to save money. We already had it down to about 30 feet, but we're bringing it, having to bring it down even further. So <clears throat> I need you to know that this building is expansive. It is odd. How many of you think it's odd? Let me see your hand. Don't lie. Yes. The rest of you are great. Thank you so much. And it, it, it makes you go say What? But I say, here I am, I want to be wherever you are, God. Take us there. Are you all with me? Let's stand to our feet. Ben, can I get you to come out?